if there was anyone to be found on Santa's naughty list, it was surely Cindy's older sister, Maddie. Cindy was eight, and Maddie was three years more, and had never said a nice thing to Cindy in her life, or so it seemed. Cindy's my favorite. Cindy's so pretty. Cindy this, Cindy that. These were the words from Maddie's mother that rang in Maddie's head through every day of the year. But especially around Christmas time, when Cindy was talking sweetly of gift giving and decorating and loving her family and friends. Cindy was sweet, but it was authentic. All she really wanted was to be loved by Maddie the way she herself loved Maddie. Since Cindy was a baby, Maddie hadn't liked her. Some of Cindy's earliest memories revolved around the constant, sideways looks she would receive from Maddie. The passive aggression, the endless competitions for mom's affection. Cindy was always the one to receive it, but on certain days, she would ask her mother to pay Maddie some attention. Oh, your sister's fine, her mother would say. Your sister gets plenty of attention. And after saying this, her mother would usually give Maddie a half-hearted pat on the head and then go right back to giving Cindy all the affection a child would ever need. It left a hollow place in Cindy. And when she tried to give Maddie the love she so desperately needed, Maddie would shun Cindy as if Cindy were a leper. Now this year, Maddie had been extra bitter. Perhaps it was the additional attention Cindy garnered for her performance in the school's Christmas play. Or maybe it was the way mom constantly bragged about Cindy's acting. She's the next Meryl Streep, I'm telling you. Cindy's mother would brag. But whatever the reason, Maddie took every chance she saw to torment her younger sister. Cindy woke up one morning with gum in her hair. Another day, she found that her underwear was soaked in honey. Her favorite dolls would go missing. The TV in her room, which Maddie wasn't allowed to have, was constantly unplugged. Yet, Cindy's desire for her sister's acceptance continued through the month of December. She continued to be kind. She persisted in giving Maddie compliments when Mother did not. The gift at the top of Maddie's Christmas list was a brand new makeup kit. Cindy made sure that she would be the one to give it to her Christmas morning. Despite all this, Cindy had felt a wear and tear from all of Maddie's torment throughout the month. And it all came to a breaking point on Christmas Eve. The family sat at the Christmas Eve dinner table and ate ham and mashed potatoes and Christmas cookies. Cindy's mother had been bragging shamelessly all night about Cindy's acting. There was no mention of Maddie, not at any point. Maddie was stewing and Cindy could see it. At one point, through all the bragging and praising and gloating, Maddie chimed in. I don't think Cindy's acting is that good, she said, matter-of-factly. It was though a bomb had gone off in the room. Everyone looked at Maddie like they were unsure they'd heard correctly. It was blasphemy. What kind of a thing is that to say? Asked Mother. Maddie shrugged. I don't know, said Maddie. I just think you're exaggerating a little bit. I mean, she's decent. All of the memories of Maddie's torment began to broil and fester in Cindy's mind. And now, here was Maddie, disparaging Cindy at the dinner table in front of the entire family, in front of all the aunts and uncles and cousins and friends. At least I'm good at something, Cindy blurted. And just like that, Maddie retracted into a pit of shame, Cindy's words ringing true and humiliating. Mother added fuel to the fire by shrugging at Maddie in a matter-of-fact manner. Your sister's got a point, said Mother. Cindy felt horrible as she watched Maddie sulk and trudge off toward the bathroom like a beaten dog. Cindy hated the power she held in her hands. That night, everyone hunkered down in their beds and waited for Santa to leave his gifts below the tree. But Cindy had trouble sleeping. It was midnight now. Cindy rarely found herself awake at this hour, but she knew why. 
Cindy removed her covers and hopped out of bed and tiptoed across her room. She was careful not to wake anyone. She opened her closet and grabbed Maddie's wrapped gift. She tiptoed down the dark hallway and dragged her fingers along the wall so as to not stumble around in the dark. I'll give Maddie her gift and tell her I'm sorry and tell her that I love her. Cindy thought to herself, that's what I'll do and she'll be happy and she'll forgive me and maybe she'll even say she loves me too. When Cindy arrived outside of Maddie's door, she heard strange shuffling noises coming from inside. Perhaps Maddie was preparing another prank for Cindy. No matter. Cindy was going to walk in and give Maddie her present and try to make amends. Cindy opened the door just a crack. She was careful not to startle Maddie. It was so dark inside the room and she couldn't see a thing. But she could hear a great deal of shuffling inside the room. Cindy stared into the room for quite some time, patiently waiting for her eyes to adjust to the gloom. When her eyes adjusted, she saw an empty bed. She saw Maddie's wide open window. She saw a seven foot figure standing in the shadows. She saw the rounded cage upon its back. And she saw Maddie sitting in the cage like a frightened bird. As Cindy's terrified eyes further adjusted to the dark, she saw the figure more clearly. It had a goat's head with large horns on top. Its eyes were red and impish and hostile. It wore a suit, much like Santa Claus, and even had jingling sleigh bells hanging from a few ends of the garments. Cindy stood frozen with fear as the creature glanced at her and gave her a nod and wink. The creature made its way toward the window. As it did, the last Cindy saw of her sister was a look of fear and sadness and regret. And then, the creature left as Cindy stood there with the present in her hand. Down the chimney he will come, with his great big grin. And you'll find that even the kitties are very liable to sin. What will Krumpus say when he finds everybody sinning? What will Krumpus say when he hears them sin, sin, sinning? Twelve seems to be the age when kids start putting the heat on their parents about the truth behind Santa. I was certainly no exception to this rule. How were Santa's elves able to make that video game I wanted in the workshop? I thought Nintendo owned Mario, or how about the ever infamous visiting every house in one night question? Did the Jolly Man own some kind of time traveling device or time extending device? Or perhaps the most obvious question of all, how could he have lived for this long? A lot of people say he trains apprentices who take his place every few decades. Others claim he's just immortal. As for everything else, magic seemed to be the universal lie everyone had agreed on. Whatever the case, I just went with the conclusion that it was my parents' doing. Of course they deny it and claim ignorance if I confronted them. But it wasn't enough to dissuade my beliefs. So one Christmas Eve, when I couldn't sleep as these questions danced among my dreams of sugar cereals and new games, I decided to investigate the noises coming from my living room. This time, surely, I would watch my dad or mom in the act of stowing presents under the tree. At least then, they'd let me in on the truth. But as I entered the living room, I saw a man before me that I didn't recognize. He was dressed in red and white, with a slightly overweight body, and he wore a stringy fake white beard. His hair, or what remained of it, was graying around the edges of his classic Santa hat, and his eyes were wide with fright as he dropped a present under the tree. Being the intuitive youth I was, I came to one of two conclusions. Either this was a home invader stealing my family's gifts, or this was the real Santa. I opened my mouth to scream, but the man rushed towards me and covered my mouth. Shh he said, putting a finger to his mouth, trying to smile. 
Tears began to roll down my cheeks. I was petrified of this man. Then, slowly, he took back his hand and extended it towards mine. It's all right there, little one. You know who I am, right? I nodded, not shaking his hand back. The trembling man nodded as well. Then, grabbed an empty sack lying on the floor and gestured to the tree. Look, see? I bring gifts. Now run along to bed, or I might have to put you on the naughty list. He started drifting towards the deeper, hearty voice stereotypically associated with Kris Kringle. But I wasn't fooled. Regardless, I wiped my eyes and began to step back from the living room, trying to create some distance between me and the stranger. The man simply watched, wiped his brow, and proceeded to approach the fireplace. I stopped and observed, confused as to how he was going to leave my house. But a blast of green flames erupted from the chimney, and the man fell back to the floor. I couldn't see his face, but I'm certain it was twisted in fear like my own. A massive bony hand spawned from the fire, and the arm that followed was draped in raggedy fur. Then another arm, and then the skull of some wild creature with two large horns followed, nearly as large as the fireplace itself. The bones popped and snapped as it slammed its hands onto the floor. The entire monster was engulfed in the flame, yet it didn't seem to burn anything in the house. Eddie, the monster declared, speaking to what I guessed to be the man on the floor. No, no, Eddie shouted back. I did my part, see? 10,000 houses, and just like you said, right? 10,000, I did my part. And yet, you allowed a human child to see you. You know the rules. Look, I, I've learned my lesson. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Just let me go, please. I delivered all the... Let you go. Did you let that woman go, Eddie? I don't seem to recall you letting her go. This was your second chance, and you've wasted it. What are you going to do? Eddie whispered. I could make out his quaking figure being overshadowed by the creature in the fireplace. The next sound to be heard was a crunch, with a soft beginning and snapping finish. I jumped as the sound repeated a few times, finally letting out a shaky breath. I prayed in my head that it wasn't what I thought, but when the creature reared its head towards me, I saw the red and white pants hanging from its mouth as it chewed on Eddie's corpse, then watched it slurp up his legs like strands of spaghetti. I covered my eyes and tried to tell myself that it wasn't real. It wasn't real. It wasn't real. And after a quiet minute, I peeked between my fingers to see the monster staring back at me from the fireplace. The pace of my breathing grew quicker and sharper, my eyes unable to escape from the grasp of those empty eye sockets. Now, run off back to bed, little one, or else I might put you on the naughty list. My legs finally found the strength to leave, and I sprinted from my parents' room, diving into the sheets with them. There wasn't a trace of the events of the night before, when my family went down to the tree the next morning. There was even a little note next to an empty glass and a half-eaten cookie on the table. Have a Merry Christmas, as Claus. As much as I tried to take in the warm, comforting atmosphere that came with Christmas Day, I couldn't stop watching the fireplace, terrified that the monster would return. At the least, now I knew the truth about Santa Claus. Mrs. Delphine Smithers was an 83-year-old who lived by herself, save for her cat. Her husband had passed away two years prior, and her children have since grown up and left the nest. But they do come Christmas time, and Mrs. Smithers gets her joy whenever her grandchildren paid a visit. She thought of the looks on their faces whenever she served them Christmas cookies and other pleasantries. This Christmas, 
she made some sweet and salty bark and kept it at the kitchen table. She found herself sitting down in her favorite chair, knitting a scarf, when there came a sharp knock on the door. She jumped a bit, not expecting any visitors at the moment. Can we come in? Smithers tentatively laid the scarf on the arm of the sofa and gripped the chair. Her frail bones popped and shifted, getting up from the chair. Smithers collected her walking stick and trudged rigidly towards the front door. Another sharp knock rung out, that time more agitated than the previous. I'm coming, hold on, Smithers yelled. She grasped the doorknob and turned it counterclockwise. The door creaked open. On the other end of the door were two children, a boy and a girl. The boy appeared older, presumably around 13. He wore a denim hoodie and gray pants. He was holding the hand of an eight-year-old girl, who was wearing a blue dress with a white lace. For whatever reason, the children had their heads bowed, looking at their feet. The boy repeated his question, can we come in? Smithers scratched her head. It was at 10 p.m. Why would these children be at her house at that time of night? Somehow, the boy must have realized what she was thinking. We need to borrow your phone. My cell phone battery is dead. Smithers thought more about the suddenness of having these unexpected guests, but they were children regardless. At the very least, she could grant them this one request. She nodded her head, gesturing the two children inside. Smithers directed them into the living room with her cat awake from the ruckus. When it set its eyes on the two mysterious children, the cat arched its back and hissed. Smithers walked over to silence her cat. Lex, these are our guests. Behave yourself. The cat meowed in defeat before running out of the living room and into the kitchen. The two children sat on the sofa, their eyes still hidden. Smithers went into the kitchen and pulled out the plate of sweet and salty bark. She returned to the living room and bent down to the children's eye level. Care for some sweets? The boy looked up. There was a good reason as to why he was shielding his eyes. They were devoid of color or pupils. Nothing more than pitch black nothingness. Whatever he was, he assuredly was not of this earthly realm. The girl looked up as well. Her eyes matched the cold blackness of the older boy. And yet most bizarre, Smithers smiled at the children, despite the hollow sockets they called eyes. The children were speechless at first. They shared a puzzled glare. The girl waved her hand in front of Smithers' face, but Smithers didn't follow the path of it. They leaned in closer, realizing that Smithers' eyes were glazed over in a thin sheet of blue. She was blind. Smithers suddenly frowned. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't care for them? Uh, thank you, the boy said. He took a piece of the sweet and salty bark and broke it in his hand before passing the girl a piece. Their heavy teeth ground down on the sweets. Oddness aside, the two children couldn't help but bask in the sweetness and saltiness of the snack. They indulged themselves in more of the sweets before getting up. They looked at the decorations with curiosity. On top of the fireplace, on a stand, was a small replica of the nativity scene. From her mental notes, she figured that the two children had stopped at the fireplace. Isn't it such a lovely display, she asked. Do you know the story of Christmas? We know about your Jesus, the boy responded. Our ancestors spoke a lot about him. Confused by this statement, Smithers nevertheless allowed the two children to further marvel at the Christmas decorations. The girl rustled the Christmas tree, causing the ornaments to fall on the ground. She stopped when she sensed Smithers getting upset. The two children played with the nutcrackers and listened to Christmas songs. The hours edged by slowly, until, 
a sudden electrical surge generated through the house. The two children looked at each other and back at Smithers. We have to go now. Our parents are here. A bright light shined through the windows. Outside was a spherical, smooth craft standing on three legs. A large, skinny creature exited the craft and stood there at the door. The two children collected the plate of sweet and salty bark and exited through the front door. There came a sound of a large whistle, as if there were a thousand steam engines situated outside. Within a flash, the craft was gone. Smithers called out for the two children, only to be met by a great silence. She closed the door and continued her knitting.